Hello all, I'm Sam Arano, and yes, the shirt is bad. But today we're not here to talk about the shirt. Today we are here to talk about Israeli political parties again. In less than two weeks, Israel will have its third election in the space of a single year. I can say with some excitement that this election has the fewest major parties of any election in Israeli history. Only eight. Perish the lack of choice. Barring some major statistical anomaly, all of these parties will be elected into the next Knesset. It's really a matter of in what numbers. And since I've already talked in the past about what these parties stand for, in this video I'm going to focus more on how the parties came to take their present form and how they interact with Israel's current political order. Starting with Likud, led by Benjamin Netanyahu. Although the Likud, in its various forms, has always been Israel's main conservative party, it has mostly been pretty moderate, at least by the standards of the U.S., where most of the views for these videos come from. But that has really changed under the past decade as Netanyahu has pulled the party platform rightward with each successive campaign in order to keep himself relevant. In fact, at this point in the triple election cycle, the Likud party platform has basically boiled down to keeping Netanyahu in power by any means. For those not in the know, Mr. Netanyahu is under criminal indictment for five counts of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust in three criminal investigations. I made a video about it here. The Likud has repeatedly campaigned on Netanyahu being the only person who can protect Israel from its enemies or from economic downturn, but his options for staying in power have gotten fewer and fewer. Other than that, the Likud supports more economic privatization and deregulation, reducing the power of the Supreme Court, and annexing Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Moving on, let's talk about Yamina, led by Naftali Bennett. Yamina is typically referred to as a far-right party, and while that is correct, Yamina isn't a party in the way that we might normally think of them. As you shall soon see in the rest of this video, most of the major parties in Israel are actually alliances of smaller parties which run on a single ballot in order to maximize their electability. But even those alliances usually survive into the Knesset session. Yamina is purely an electoral alliance. Immediately after running in the previous election, Yamina broke up into its smaller parts, and I would expect that to happen again. But why? Yamina specifically represents two very distinct far-right ideologies. The new right is much more economically conservative, in fact it's the only party in Israel that endorses trickle-down economics, and it also supports cooperation between religious and secular interests, whatever that means. Whereas the Jewish Home and National Union parties are primarily focused with promoting religiosity in defiance of the secular majority. Both parties support annexing West Bank settlements while leaving the Palestinian Authority as a permanent stateless entity, expanding religious education in secular schools, affirming Israel as the nation-state of the Jewish people and only the Jewish people, and reforming the labor laws to make future unionization impossible. In my opinion, Yamina is the faction that most closely resembles the Republican Party in the U.S., and though it isn't that large of a bloc, they only won seven seats in the September election. This is the faction that has sent Netanyahu and the Likud running further right over the past decade. But in that same period, support for the religious right has actually declined. Even though around 10% of Israelis identify as national religious, for which read orthodox, uh, Yamina is pulling firmly in the single digits. There just seems to be a lot of disillusionment with the idea that having a religious voice in the government requires embracing this very conservative ideology or wanting to impose a religious test on the country as a whole. Now we move from the Orthodox to the Ultra-Orthodox. United Torah Judaism, led by Yaakov Litzman. UTJ represents, essentially, the Hasidic version of Ultra-Orthodox Judaism. It is very doctrinaire and basically takes its marching orders from a self-appointed rabbinical council called the Sages. UTJ and its predecessor parties originally formed to keep the ultra-Orthodox community alive after the Holocaust, but as that community has grown to about 10% of the population, UTJ's focus has steadily shifted to making sure the government bestows large welfare benefits on the community and exempts its members from military conscription. More recently, UTJ has launched a campaign to stop the government from conducting any public works or letting businesses or transportation to run on Saturdays. In terms of public support, these are all very much losing battles. None of these policies are remotely popular and have only become less so over time, even as the population has steadily grown more religious. But as it's almost impossible to form a government without some ultra-Orthodox cooperation, they persist. 
Outside of the Netanyahu of it all, this is very much the defining issue of this era of Israeli politics, and it really exposes the weaknesses of Israel's entire political system. Ideally, having lots of parties representing a diversity of opinions should be good at balancing consensus decision-making with representing minority voices, but in this particular case, it is the consensus that ends up being sacrificed to satisfy those minority interests at all costs. But it is not the only ultra-Orthodox party, which leads us to... Shas, led by Arye Derry. I have previously described Shas as an ultra-Orthodox party, and while that does accurately reflect the party's platform, it's not very reflective of who votes for them. After all, if ultra-Orthodox Israelis represent 10% of Israeli voters, but hold 16 votes in the Knesset, they must have some cultural appeal beyond religion itself. Much in the same way that Canada has a very reactionary, vaguely anti-Western fringe on its left, Israel has a very reactionary, vaguely anti-Western fringe on its right. Shas officially says that its mission is both to secure economic justice for Jewish immigrants from places other than Europe, as well as to spread religious practice throughout secular society, effectively seeking to de-Europeanize Judaism and, in their own words, return the crown to its former glory. In terms of political outcomes, however, there's very little separating Shas from UTJ. Both of their leaders have even been recommended for indictment in some very heinous crimes. So you're probably thinking, if these ultra-Orthodox interests are so unpopular, why do conservatives keep forming a government with them? One party says, that's a very good question. Yisrael Betenu, led by Avigdor Lieberman. So, in the 1990s, there was a sufficiently huge wave of Jewish immigrants arriving in Israel from the former Soviet Union that an entire political movement could be established catering directly to their needs. In keeping with the backlash against the Soviet era, Yisrael Betenu is very economically conservative, but it also reflects that the Soviet community in Israel is overwhelmingly very secular. Under the Soviet regime, Jews had to halt their religious traditions. Often, Jewish men married non-Jewish women and fathered children who were Jewish enough to become citizens of Israel, but not Jewish enough to be, say, married in an Orthodox synagogue. This kind of disconnect has made everyday life quite hard for Soviet Israelis, so Yisrael Betenu's leader, Avigdor Lieberman, has vowed not to join any government that includes the religious parties. To a certain degree, this anti-clerical rebranding was something of a Hail Mary. As the decades have gone by, many Soviet Israelis have found more natural homes in other parties, the children of Soviet immigrants are a lot more assimilated into the Israeli mainstream, and those younger people who are still coming from Russia and its neighbors now are much more left-leaning, having grown up mostly with Putin. So while Yisrael Beitenu is almost certain to win some seats in this election, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the last time. So that, broadly speaking, is the right. What about everyone else? Well, leading the pack is Blue and White, led by Benny Gantz. So I've heard the BBC refer to Blue and White as a center-left party, and I've heard Vox refer to it as a right-wing party, so which is it? Yes! Blue and White is another alliance of smaller parties. Gantz himself is the leader of the center-left resilience, but the alliance also includes the centrist Yesh Atid and the right-wing Telem. Blue and White is essentially pro-secular and anti-Netanyahu, but its existence also kind of exposes the datedness of traditional Israeli political narratives. Throughout most of its history, Israel's political leadership has consisted almost entirely of these very beloved top-level military figures, like Yitzhak Rabin or Ariel Sharon, but most national-level Israeli politicians today come to prominence by serving as mayors or party activists, but there's still this lingering expectation that some general will come along and just be prime minister. Blue and White contains on its list no fewer than four former heads of the IDF, and while they do kind of fulfill that narrative, they just don't get the same kind of popular recognition. But that still works right now, because having so many military leaders in a united front against Netanyahu really undermines Netanyahu's narrative that he is the person who has kept Israel safe all these years. If this election manages to result in a new government, the incoming prime minister will either be Netanyahu or Gantz. Next up, Labour Gesher Meretz, led by Amir Peretz. For the first several decades after independence, Israel's left completely dominated politics, which is to say that the secular left wing outnumbered every other political camp combined. Over time, it's become more and more marginal as Israel has become more capitalist and Israeli politics has become less centered around the kind of grand national figures that don't really exist anymore. The same kind of grand national figures that 
blue and white is trying to embody. But because the Israeli left was so dominant for so long, it has always had the privilege to remain bitterly divided between a more urban, working class faction and a more educated, idealistic faction. In this cycle, most of the popular support that would go to the left has been effectively poached by blue and white, so in the interest of pooling their vote totals, four of the standalone left-wing parties have united to form Labour Gesher Meretz. They are pro-union, pro-rent control, they support a two-state solution, etc. There's actually been a lot of angst over this union to the effect of, what would my democratic socialist grandparents think if they knew we were in a union with social democrats? But for the most part, these ideological differences are mostly historical and image-based and don't have a lot to do with what's actually going on in the country today. And finally, let's talk about the Joint List, led by Ayman Odeh. Throughout Israel's history as an independent country, there have always been parties which appealed specifically to Arab voters, but most of these early parties were affiliated with the bigger Jewish parties, which ultimately absorbed them. Fully ideologically independent Arab parties re-emerged in the 1990s, and despite their jarring ideological differences, most of the past decade they've been united in a marriage of convenience called the Joint List. The largest partner within the joint list is the communist party Hadash, led by Ayman Odeh. Hadash is not an exclusively Arab party, it has Jewish voters and Jewish candidates, but it is effectively the main Arab voice. As the endless election cycle has continued, Odeh and Hadash have actually come to be seen as more legitimate and respectable, which is exactly what Odeh would like. I wouldn't be surprised at all if in the future Hadash was part of a governing coalition. But the joint list is not just Hadash, and that's kind of the problem. On the other end of the the spectrum is Balad, led by Matanes Shahade. Balad is essentially a protest party which claims to represent the Palestinian people even though the Palestinian territories are not part of Israel itself and thus its citizens don't vote in our elections. Its members have also been frequently accused, and not unjustly, of promoting conspiracy theories in the plenum and engaging in racism, like just last week when Shahade refused to attend an Arab cultural celebration in Baqa because a Jewish politician, a fellow opposition member, was also in attendance. Balad also notoriously burned the opposition this past October by refusing to cast its three votes to support Gantz as prime minister, which helped trigger this election. And that's kind of the problem with these big alliances. By casting your vote for Hadash, you're also casting your vote for Balad. If we ever have a government, I might give my predictions on how Israeli politics will shift in the future, but I'll leave it at this. If you want Netanyahu to be prime minister, vote for one of these parties. If you want Gantz to be prime minister and for Netanyahu gone, vote for one of these parties. If you want Netanyahu and Gantz to share power, vote for this party. And if you want Gantz to be prime minister but don't actually want him to have a majority government, vote for this party. I'll see you after election day. I hope.